Hello, it's Michael Watts here, and welcome to episode 10 of Life on the Fretboard, a series of face-to-face -face conversations with extraordinary people. Uh, this interview was brought to you by the kind and much appreciated sponsorship of Elixir Strings, more of which later. Now, this is a special interview for several reasons. First, it was recorded in Cape Town, South Africa, on a beautiful sunny day. It was windy, though. It often is in Cape Town, and at times you can hear that wind rustling the palm trees outside. Now, I was in South Africa to spend time with my friends Matthew Rice and Matthias Rue of Kasimi Guitars, and to pick up my new acoustic instrument, a bespoke masterpiece, quite frankly, that they had made for me. Now, incidentally, Matthew and Matthias feature in this month's episode of Luthier on Luthier with His Excellency the Wood Poet, Michael Bashkin. Check it out later. You will love it. It was a joy to be in South Africa, getting some much-needed winter sunshine, great food and inspiration. And on that note, it was a wonderful surprise to learn that another old friend was taking a well-earned break from his heavy global touring schedule and was available for a thorough catch-up for Fretboard Journal. Although the gentleman of Kasimi Guitars and I, well, we also had a pretty hefty round of radio interviews scheduled during my stay, we managed to grab some time to drive over and set up some mics. It was so much fun. I've been looking forward to sharing this one with you. So let me introduce you. Derek Gripper plays Marleyan Cora music on a vintage Hermann Hauser classical guitar. And if that doesn't get your attention, well, I'm afraid nothing will. John Williams himself describes feeling that this was, and I quote, absolutely impossible until I heard Derek Gripper do it. So that's pretty cool. Derek and I talk about his work translating the music of this beautiful, delicate African harp to the nylon string guitar and the extraordinary instruments he's used in his quest to make the music in his head come to life, including eight strings, fanned frets, and, get this, interchangeable magnetic fretboards, which is actually a hell of a name for a band. But yes, he has gone deep here. Also discussed, Derek's visit to the Hauser Guitars Workshop, to choose a career-defining instrument from their archive. His trust in embracing the less good idea and his love of single-purpose technology from Roliflex medium-format cameras to his vintage Nagra reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Speaking of which, I also managed to record Derek playing my new guitar using this beautiful bit of kit and some microphones by Microtech FL and Roya Labs, and I've left a link to the results in the description to this podcast. I really hope you enjoy it. Derek Gripper is a true iconoclast, as comfortable with Bach as he is with Tumani Diabate. He has an orchestral sound when playing solo, filling concert halls around the world on a regular basis, and he's also one of the most quick-witted and funny people it is my pleasure to know. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So join us now, sheltered from the hot African sun in Derek's home, the tea has brewed and the fun is just beginning. So this podcast is called Life on the Fretboard and it is a series of face-to-face -face interviews with people who I find extraordinary and inspiring. And uh, Derek Ripper, you are definitely one of those. That's so sweet of you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, coming from the uh, fingerstyle guitar world, that normally involves a steel string instrument. So and to tapping see, on the fretboard. Well, possibly. I mean, I try and keep that to the bare minimum mm. necessary. <laughs> um, Just because you can do something. <laughs> There's no reason why you should. <laughs> That's often very true. And uh, you play a nylon string. I love the sound of nylon string guitars, uh, in particular, you know, vintage houses, uh, great sound. Um, and yet you are using all sorts of uh, fairly esoteric tunings that normally wouldn't be encountered on a nylon string instrument. Hmm. I mean, I don't think I do extended techniques. I just sort of pluck the string, <laughs> mostly. Um, the tuning is something that classical guitar, we use uh, about three two alternate tunings one is drop mm. and then sometimes they they take the g string to f sharp to make it like a lute right. like a renaissance lute tuning 
So those are really the only tunings. The main reason is music is staff notation. And the problem with staff notation is if you change the tuning, the A isn't where the A is anymore. And so, yeah. so that is the, the, you know, the biggest problem. There's a beautiful piece uh, by uh, the classical guitar composer Carlo Domeniconi called Gita, which he's never published and never recorded because his recording company insists that he has everything that he records published and he can't write this piece down. Oh. And of course, his most famous piece, Koyambaba, is written in a kind of weird staff notation tablature where you have mm. the sounding uh, you know, notation on the top and you have the tablature notation, which is also a staff notation, but it's where you play it. It's awful. It's such a mess. <laughs> you know, and this is the problem with the classical guitar is that they mm. are trapped in standard tuning because of, of the notation. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you should use a word like trapped. I mean, a lot of uh, classical players that I've spoken to have talked about the instrument in terms of its limitations. Mm. That doesn't seem to be something that affects you. Yeah, I don't know what what they find. What do they find limiting? Well, the uh, exactly what you said. Oh, yeah. You know, and and the existing repertoire, perhaps mm. the a repertoire that's very much based in Western harmony, mm. uh, in a certain uh, mindset, mm. perhaps that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. It is a bit of a, it's, it's not a very exciting time, classical guitar. I mean, I think it had a beautiful beginning. You know, it was a lovely idea, you know, Segovia coming and playing almost these beautiful orchestral miniatures, you know, on this instrument that nobody had heard in a concert hall. That was a lovely, wonderful thing. And then, John, um, you know, Bream and Williams came along and they, you know, took it to a, a new level, you know, especially Bream, getting Benjamin Britten to write for the guitar, you know, exactly. incredible things like that. Taking on from Manuel de Faye wrote a beautiful piece uh, in, in the early 20th century, which for me is a kind of signpost for an interesting direction for the guitar. And Bream definitely followed that, you know, with Britten. And, but then it kind of died out and it's become, it's become a kind of uh, uh, gymnastic you know, it's a kind of it's 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 weird. It's like if you, if you made a parallel with art, it would be like those drawings. You know, where you you know someone has got very good at drawing something absolutely perfectly, and you mm. know, and you and I, you know, both know that that's not going to be very interesting. You know, if you go and you know you look at a beautiful Picasso, there's nothing photoreal about it. You know, he's not sitting there. <laughs> you know, there's this gesture, and mm. you know, there's something being said because we want the drawing to be the drawing. We don't want it to be. A replication of of whatever he was drawing. We're not really interested, mm. in, you know, in the bull that he was originally drawing or whatever it is. That's the problem in in the classical guitar at the moment. Is that you know the score has become this important thing, and the composer and the and the competition between players of who can play neater and faster mm. and you know more uniformly and and that's not what the instrument does very interestingly because you can do that and work very very hard at doing that, but then you listen to someone playing a very simple piece on the piano and everything that you've been trying to do for 20 years is there effortlessly in the first year of playing the piano you know sure. you can get a clean sound and a crispness and everything so yeah we work we're barking up the wrong tree you know 100%. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to say guys but that's <laughs> well that may be uh thrown into most sharp relief uh in your own work with bach and your own interpretations mm -hmm. how did you approach that um, well, Bach is something I've always played. I suppose when I discovered that I had, had made, you know, the decision without my knowledge of to, to be a classical guitarist and that I didn't really like the music, then then I realized, well, the one thing that I played that I really could keep playing and keep exploring was Bach. Right. And then when I started to decide to pay more attention to what I really liked and what I really listened to. And one of the things that I discovered um, is my sort of origin story is, is the music of Tumani Diabate playing the Kora. I couldn't play the music. There was no score of the music. Uh, so I would listen to his music and then I'd play Bach in the style of. And, oh, wow. and what that started to teach me was a different way to phrase and a different way to hear Bach because uh, Tumani comes from an oral tradition, mm -hmm. as does Bach. You know, and we receive Bach later from a printed score without being in the musical milieu, you know, like, and without an understanding mm. of, of that, having that sound. So we go, you know, we've got a metronome in our head and we've got this idea that we need to make it as, you know. Absolutely right. Mm. Now, the uh, <coughs> Fretboard Journal audience 
It was a very discerning and uh, Hi. open-minded bunch. Good, good. They may, uh, however, not be entirely familiar with the work of Tumani Diabate. Would mm. you like to talk a little bit about him? So Tumani is, I mean, if you're a guitar player, if you're a classical guitar player, Tumani is like the John Williams of Cora in my in my mind. Uh, he's he's got he's very very clear, very very pristine sound, unparalleled in in the Cora. He's an incredible uh, melodicist, uh, com, you know, improviser, composer, and one of the great things he does is contrapuntal imp- improvisation. Yeah. Um, so he recorded the world's first solo instrumental Cora album in 1987, 88. Uh, there was another album by his uncle in the Gambia at the, the same year, mm-hmm. um, but Tumani's really, you know, had a, ma- a major impact. It was five of the 20th century core Cora pieces that he did in these incredible virtuosic um, versions, with you know keeping all the parts together, really like a kind of Bach-like counterpoint. Uh, that was when he was 21, and wow. so if you if you were continue on the, on the John Williams analogy you know, the Julian Bream of the Kore in my mind would be <laughs> Balakesi Soko who, right. who got together with Tumani in 1996 and recorded an album called New Ancient Strings which paid tribute to uh, an album made in the 70s by both of their fathers called Ancient Strings mm. so yeah there's uh, the Kore is a 21 string harp it's from, it's from the Manding Empire in uh, West Africa uh, Tumani and Malike are from Mali. Mali wasn't really originally a Kora uh, place, it, um, right. but the, the Kora was much more associated with the Gambia um, and Senegal, but Tumani's father uh, moved from the Gambia to Mali. And there's this very distinctive Malian style that has, that has evolved out of, out of that move, in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and Tumani, you know, was one of the really, the trailblazers trailblazers in that style and and Balakesi Soko today as well. And in the process of adapting the music of the Kora for the guitar, are you using any techniques that come f- uh, directly from instrument to instrument or are you approaching it from a guitaristic point of view, let's say? No, 100% guitaristic. As I said, I didn't transcribe the music first. I listened to the music and applied it to what I could play, which was Bach or anything like that. So it meant that you start to listen to Bach and you start to organize the music of Bach by the phrases rather than by the metrical, you know, background, you know, the the time signature. You're really hearing the phrases as though you're learning it phrase by phrase, melody by melody. And each phrase becomes a gesture which has an impulse at the beginning and then kind of the, the energy <clears throat> deteriorates and you know and then another one comes and then you start to hear the rhythm the dance rhythm of Bach is not a metrical uh, dance r- rhythm as you know as, as we perceive dance in the in the age of you know the machine you know one two three four <laughs> the dance becomes something about gestures and the gestures are long and then short and expanded and contracted um, so that was my first lesson in chora playing then after uh, about a decade of listening to him I had the brainwave of actually trying to learn to play his music and then uh, I suppose in terms of you know you're talking about extended techniques I did, made the decision to use the guitar as a found object so oh, not right. to go listen to him and go that's a C major where C major on the guitar sure. you know? but I listened to the recording and I had the, the possibility of adding a capo mm-hmm. I had the possibility of changing um, the tuning of any string and of course retuning the recording as well so I had these three variables right. I could play with and I would just go in and I'd listen and I'd turn strings and move capos and retune recordings until I felt that it fell like I wanted it to fall. To fall. And the, the model in my mind was the music of the vihuela, which is the old um, Renaissance Spanish guitar-shaped mm, exactly. harp-like sound. And, and that's exacerbated in my understanding. That there isn't a lot of... Uh, ornamentation of, of the initial note in the vihuela, so there's not a lot of uh, vib- uh, vibrato or anything like that on the note itself. Well, so we don't know because the, the recordings never lasted, you know. So. Well, I- exactly, but the uh, the performances I've seen, the fingering is more about purely shortening the length of the string and hmm. ra- raising the pitch, or, hmm. uh, rather than 
you know, side to side vibrato or you know, big yeah. <laughs> into the realms of, of absurdity, or like big BB King bends. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. No, so because like, the instrument didn't do that. Is what didn't have sustain as much. But we don't, you know, we don't know. It's conjecture. There's very much little we know. But I mean, when you just when you look at the actual scores, which are tablatures. Mm. You know, the, the, the way everything's in the first position, which is, wasn't mm. West Montgomery said all the money was in the first position. <laughs> yeah, there's no money past the fifth front. Yeah, exactly. It's Chet Atkins' version of that. Yeah, and uh, in many ways, that's that's just as true today as it, as yeah. it ever was. So that's, yeah, so I, I started to arrange the music like that, which got me to the point of realizing that there was a tuning that actually worked for the core, rep, for, for the standard core repertoire, which was a bit disappointing because at the time I thought, okay, wow, there's going to be a, there's going to be a tuning for each piece. Right. You know, which was a lovely idea, but then I realized, you know, they all work. Do, because do they all work? Really? They all work in the, what I now call my core tuning, you know. Mm. Which is, yeah. And in the transcription from the, re, uh, the records, mm. let's say, because you said that, that listening to the, the vinyl uh, was, was part of that experience, mm. uh, were there bits that the quality of the recording had hidden in the first instance that you uh, discovered later or details that you discovered with further listening? Um, I wasn't listening on vinyl actually I was listening on a, on a CDR um, pirated right. copy uh, <laughs> but, and actually the real revelation I, w- I remember was when I was when transcribing uh, Jarabi uh, um, I was listening through my computer speakers at the time because I didn't have a stereo oh, right. and I didn't have headphones. And then I plugged it into a, a portable PA that I had and suddenly I heard this huge bass coming out and I realized that there was a bass line going all the way through. <laughs> so there were moments like that, but nothing to do with the actual recording. Oh, okay. More to do with what I was using to replicate them. <laughs> yeah, speakers weren't that big in the early 2000s, you know. That's true. We, we, didn't, we didn't have all this like hyped bass. I'd like to take a moment to thank my sponsors for this episode, and indeed the previous two, Elixir Strings. Now, I know we all have our preferences, especially when it comes to coated strings, but having tried literally every other brand on the market, I can say confidently that if you're looking for long-lasting great tone that also limits string squeak and rust, Elixir are the way forward. Let me prove it. Turn off the music and listen for a moment. have been on my guitar for over a year. No other strings come close, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm very grateful to Elixir Strings for helping me sound as good as I can all these years. Visit elixirstrings.com and check out the whole range, and tell them I sent you. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the instruments that you have used and played over the mm. years. Well, it's going to be a short conversation because I've only had one guitar for 20 years. Yeah. Oh, but there must have been you know, a couple before that. Uh, my f- first guitar was this, like a factory-made Spanish guitar that a friend of mine still has. I played it a while back. It's, it's still on. It's, it's, not, it's not doing too badly. I got that at school. Mm-hmm. And then I went with that guitar to my first guitar festival, which was at West Dean in, in England, uh, the West Dean Guitar Festival, I which, know was, it very well, yeah. which was a marvelous festival and really mind boggling for me. And I think that first one, it was the yeah, Sud Brothers were right. there. And it's from them that I learned two very important things uh, in my playing. I think it was from that, you know, two weeks that I spent there. And the wonderful thing about, you know, being in Cape Town is that there was very little input. So if, if you learned <laughs> two things and you took them home and you worked on them for a year, uh, something really marvelous happens as opposed to learning two things and then a, a week later downloading some video and going mm. like, oh, there's something else. And before you know it, you've forgotten. <laughs> so we didn't have, you know, there was no, there was no YouTube, you know, there was no mm. recordings, you know, so it was, it was a really great way to learn, actually. Um, at that first festival, I met a German guitar builder who was living in Granada. I bought a guitar from him. It turned out he'd actually snuck into the festival. He wasn't supposed to be there. Oh, wow. Uh, and he <laughs> just, like, so sold it to me under the table. It, it was a beautiful guitar, but it was very... <coughs> it was very... 
it was it was too lightly built so oh, yes. i used to have a lot of dreams where i'd wake up i'd you know i'd open the case and it would be in pieces it kind of gave you this feeling that it was going to explode it's happened to me in the present is, is that your anxiety dream where the it was then yeah you know no i don't have anxiety dreams about guitars anymore but then i did and and it, and it had that feeling and it buzzed so my experience of playing guitars was that every guitar you had to learn its problems and you had to mm. work your way around and playing a lot of practicing was about remembering okay i need to back off here you know so then i really wanted to i got i got involved in the music of paul galbraith listening to paul galbraith who played an eight string classical mm. guitar yes indeed. so i went to a guitar builder in johannesburg called mervyn davis and he mm. built me an eight string guitar with removable fretboards for microtonal uh, wow. music as well uh, that guitar he was in the middle of an experiment um, he had an instrument called a smooth talker which you might that's have heard right. of that's right yes I have and he had the idea that he could make a normal looking guitar that functioned like a smooth talker and he made that for me unfortunately that wasn't a very successful it, it, you know, it, um, it was an experiment that I was kind of the brunt of and it didn't, it didn't work it sounded more like a, a cupboard than a, than a guitar, uh, sadly. And so we, we went backwards and forwards, Mervyn and I, on that project, but I moved on from that. And I started working with a local architect in Cape Town uh, called Colin Cleveland, who was a lovely man who had been building as a hobby for years, and he agreed to make me a, a, an eight string, and he made a beautiful eight string. Uh, it, was a, it was a carved back, uh, variable fret lengths you know fanned frets um we did actually take the fretboard off and put a magnetic 31 tone equal temperament fretboard on that could, yeah, I mean, why just, wouldn't you? Um, but then then the, then the then the next started moving so we we, we we just put the original on so it it was for about three weeks it was a 31 tone wow. uh, microtonal guitar but that didn't last uh that guitar was great it was very hard to play it had the humphreys um, you know, raised fretboard mm. thing, and there was something about that that no matter what you did, it was hard work. Right. So practicing again was about accommodating this instrument and the difficulties of this instrument. And I got extremely frustrated, and I actually eventually took it to him and I said, "Look, you've got to make this thing playable. I don't want it anymore." <laughs> and I and I I had a Yamaha that I'd been living in a house like a student house, and some guy hadn't paid his rent and. He'd moved out and he left his guitar. And when he came back, we all just pretended we didn't know what he was talking about. And so it was a 1978 Nippon Gaki. Am I saying it right? Uh, Yamaha. Uh, and I thought, well, you know what? The story I've been hearing from all classical guitar makers is the classical guitar doesn't actually work. Um, we have solved the problem by doing this or that or the other. Right. You know? And I thought, well, you know what? I've never actually played a real classical guitar. So I'm supposed to be a classical guitar player, but in, and everyone's saying they're innovating mm. because, you know, we, we're here out in the, you know, it's the same in Australia, like with the Smallman and that, you know, this, this idea that we've taken something that was broken and made something new. Exactly. So I thought, I'm going to go to the source. So I mm -hmm. emailed Herman Hauser. He told me three things, the cost, the waiting time. I can't remember what the third one was. Um, maybe only told me two things and no that was right he told me two things now I had three problems one which was that I couldn't wait didn't have the money <laughs> and I really needed a guitar right now so that's that's also only two things in my mind it was three so he very nicely said one second let me chat to a friend of mine who's a collector I've just given him a new guitar he got a guitar from me last year he doesn't need two of my guitars right. and he got this guy to sell me the guitar and then it was too difficult to get there to get the guitar here mm -hmm. they said look let me take a thousand euros off the price of the guitar and you fly here to get fetch it oh that's right kind. so i went he put me in this in his father's house who passed away it was empty and he gave me the key to two rooms which each had about 150 guitars in them wow. and he said and it was a week and he said play them all <laughs> and i had my one that i had been given now which i very much loved and they had little labels on it that would say Segovia 1960 or this, that. And it was always guitars that had been given to Segovia and rejected really? or given to Segovia and then got back later or a Stauffer from the 1800s that he'd, you know, just oh, come on. the whole history of guitar was there. Yeah. <laughs> All the houses from the early pre-Segovia houses, which were like the German style guitars, which mm. are like sort of, you know, kind of cross between a guitar and a sewing machine. 
and or like a steam powered something <laughs> they have this beautiful this almost harpsichord like sound mm. and much smaller and you know more more like playing an electric guitar really especially this stuff you know you can mm. play a note and then just hammer on for a day <laughs> um so i i really learned and in that week really developed a respect for this instrument and the mm. fact that actually yes they knew exactly what they were doing back then you might want to change and make something new but it definitely worked it did what it was supposed to do so i left with that guitar and that was 2004 and i'm so this year is 2024 so it's 20 years i've been playing that guitar <laughs> You mentioned the eight-string guitar hmm. uh, within the context of the, the classical guitar. That is tuned. Am I right in thinking it's not tuned with two bass strings? No. How does that work? It's Paul's um, thing, which is a wonderful idea, but it comes with a lot of problems. It's, so it's like a high string and a low string, and what right. it means is that you suddenly have instead of three octaves in one hand position, you have four octaves. Mm. So the you know the possibilities, especially for Paul, who's arranging a lot of piano music, you you're not stretching sixteen frets to get you know right. that range. Everything happens under under your fingers. It's an it's an incredible uh, you know setup for mm. people who are dissatisfied with life and want to play music with four octave ranges. But if you if you just want to live a happy happy life, mm. then the six string guitar is perfect. Three octaves is fine. <laughs> it's all you, you know, need to the do. problem with the eight string, the difficulty is is the, that top string is pretty high. Mm. So what Paul does is he has an E string that's tuned up to A and it's quite a small thing and then it fans out, you know. Right. And and he's it, it means he's got a huge amount of tension mm. on the string. He's he's had various iterations of the guitar over the years and it, it totally works now. He didn't explain that in the liner notes that I read um, back then, right. you know, before we had the internet. So I just read, you know, the first iteration, which was, you know, 66 centimeters to 63 and off you go. And it doesn't, it's not that simple. So <laughs> I did struggle along with that guitar. Um, I did make a record on it in mm -hmm. 2003. Um, and I really enjoyed it as a composing Thing because like alternate tunings it suddenly just gave you a new instrument you know new possibilities swapping out fretboards mm. on a guitar that's not something that a lot of people do particularly regularly and i know that it's not something that you do with your house but i'm intrigued because uh, it gives me the impression that a lot of what you were looking for in the past might have been microtonal mm. yeah well i was ideologically opposed to <laughs> to equal temperament <laughs> I did a, I did a master's, I did my master's degree on the music of Harry Parch, the microtone exactly, composer. Exactly, yes. Mostly not on the, um, you know, my friend Chris Rainier has mm. really looked into, into that music and has continued, you know, in incredible ways to, to look into Harry Parch's uh, music. Uh, I was more looking at the kind of philosophy of it, you know, what does it mean right. to be, you know, trapped in a system, let's say. And, and what does the system define the music that you make, mm. you know? Um, so, but, uh, you know, and there, and there are people now who have solved, you know, that problem in different ways. Tulgahan in, in, in Turkey is making these beautiful mm. um, movable fret guitars. Again, very complicated. What I do now is I just don't tune the guitar very well and then you actually end up with some nice things. Uh, also, after about 15 years, the houses frets got very very low mm. and so the the break point was quite bad and that made things pretty wacky too although matthias of Cassimi persuaded me that i was you know i was missing out and he <laughs> re missing out on replaced the, the frets now now it's like slightly more in tune which is a bit disappointing but what can you do? <laughs> well look at that time really does fly when you're having fun this is episode 10 and what a pleasure it's been to share these conversations with you so far. Your support for this podcast means a great deal, and I'm very grateful to you all. Now, if you are enjoying this episode of Life on the Fretboard, then please do consider a contribution via the tip jar link in the description below. Thank you very much. As well as arranging the Malian music for guitar, you're also a composer. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's a nice thing to think. Yeah. 
I do try and write music. I think there was about 10 years between 2011, 2021 when I didn't write anything because I was so busy with the unearthing of this, this core music and discovery of it. Um, and there was just so much, you know, it's like you were just suddenly in the middle of this great, huge library. Um, but then I did start writing music again, first using what I'd learned. So I made a record called A Year of Swimming, mm -hmm. where there were, you know, things that were very much from what I'd learned from the Cora, but now composing. And then, yeah, then I started started writing music again. I made an album called Billy Goes to Durban, which had a lot of, you know, original pieces. And it's been, it's been moving again, slowly but surely. I forget to do it um, for long <laughs> periods of time. And then suddenly I discovered that that fun of finding something, fiddling around with it for a few days, letting it change, you know. And I've discovered that the, you know, because I had learned composition in the university where you kind of had to write music mm. and, so, and you had ideas and that. And it was, was kind of frowned on to sort of sit and noodle until you found something. Well, that's, that was going to be my, my next question, actually, whether or not you write with the instrument in your hand. Yes. So, right. Well, I, I wrote a lot of things by hand. And, and had ideas and tried to develop them using the wealth of, of, <laughs> of things that had been taught to me at, at university and, 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 and the ideas that I had. And I just realized years later that everything that I'd ever done by hand, I never played. And everything that I'd worked on the guitar were the things that I actually played. So I finally decided, you know what, this is the tool for thinking, is the guitar. Yeah. That's, the, that's, that's my tool for thinking about sound. And it's a perfectly valid tool, you know. And... And the developments that happen are physical accidents, uh, moments of forgetting, misremembering, uh, discovery mm. on the instrument. And yeah, and that, that, that works for me because it means I can really explore, you know, tunings. And, and it's very simple, you know, it's not a, you know, there's no rocket science involved really. It's just like, I'd say the best, one of the nicest experiences I've had with um, composing is something that I haven't uh, recorded yet. Although I did part of it now when we were recording your new Cassimi mm -hmm. guitar. Uh, I, it's called The Moss on the Mountain. And it, it looks at the idea of, um, of having a bad idea and allowing the bad idea to be the impetus for work. <laughs> How beautiful. And, and it, it, it comes from a, a, an idea of the, the artist William Kentridge, who has a center in Johannesburg called the Center for the Less Good Idea. Oh, wow. And so there is this kind of like... Um, it's almost like uh, emergency that happens, you know, <laughs> where you have a bad idea, you're either going to erase it mm. or you're going to have to work with it. You know? And you have to do it immediately. You have to either erase it and forget it or you have to get to work quickly. Oh, to okay. Make it. And, that's, and that's what I did with this piece. And it's, it's been one of the sort of most enjoyable moments. And the original idea was really horrific. <laughs> Very embarrassing, you know, cheesy and just and sentimental, just sort of like adolescent, really horrible. And I stuck with it. And mm -hmm. it's and it comes from the idea of the thing, the moss in the mountain. I was up on the up 2,500 meters up in the mountains uh, in Canada, and I met a Australian, and he said to me that the moss that grew there, you had to be very careful because it took 40 years to grow. Mm -hmm. So going down the mountain, I was thinking about Kentridge's Center for the Less Good Idea, and I was thinking about 40 years to become moss. So I thought, next, next bad idea I have, I'm going to give it 40 years. So I'm a year what? and a half in, and I already like it. And I've still got 37 and a half it years to go. You imagine what it's going to be like in exactly. 37 and a half years. And that's the other thing with composing is the recomposing, which I think comes a little bit from african music you know the it, 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 there's a lot of recycling that happens mm. in in the in in all oral traditions but you you see it really alive and well today in the african tradition um where you just change one thing and the person who you thought wrote it will tell you oh that's your composition now you know and you've just like <laughs> you've just like done something wrong or whatever and then so that's a creative act right so uh, what i've also realized is that i don't need a lot of compositions you know, of my own. I don't need to go looking for a new piece every minute. Mm. I've, I have a core um, repertoire of 10 or 20, 20, 30 compositions of mine that I forget, come back to, learn again, uh, remember again, never from the recording, always from, the, you know, from my fingers. You know, mm. it'll be 10 years later and you're like, wait, there was this thing. 
and then reworking it and recomposing it and changing it and coming back to it with a new perspective. Uh, it's a wonderful example of that. I, I wrote a piece in 2009 called The Quirky for the Comicky Whales. And that for me was filed away as like Gismonti esque, strange droning, big timbral exploration guitar music. Mm. And then there was Tumani's music, which was filed away as kind of Bach like groove African. And then I went into the studio last year in London with Baleke Sisoko mm. and we played that piece. And because he's now got, wow. he's got a chromatic chora that can change very quickly with these. Like sharp, levers. Like sharpening levers or something like that. Exactly. Right. He could suddenly just play with that piece. So we wow. made a version of this piece which was absolutely filed in the other room from the chorus music in my head. Suddenly was with it. So now that's made me think about that piece in a completely different way and, and reintegrate it into, you know, into concerts and uh, playing it in a different way. We just uh, filmed a beautiful performance with, as you said, my, my new uh, Kasimi acoustic guitar. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, for putting your own music through that thing. It's still at the very green stage, so uh, the more it gets, the better. They do. They change, they change so much, they do as they grow up. <laughs> they do. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, we actually recorded it using a uh, Nagra reel to reel. This is something that you use quite a lot. Uh, tell me about the process of recording to tape, what that demands from you as a uh, performer. So the, the, I think that what I was searching for was single function devices, really, because I find that recording yourself on a computer, I hate doing that because it's too easy to delete. Mm. And, and it's, so every act feels meaningless, really, because you can just delete it immediately. So um, you can solve that by recording in a studio digitally with somebody else, mm. because then you just record and then you go back and you listen and then you realize that thing that while you were playing, you thought you didn't like, you actually did like, you know, and, and that's, you know, so I like those creative accidents that happen in the studio. Right. But wanting to record myself and be a little bit more, um, you know, be able to just mess around on a day to day basis. Because I really do love recording. And mm. I thought to myself, why? I only do it once a year. It's like the best thing I enjoy doing and you only get to do it once a year. It seems silly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was, um, I was introduced to the Nagra, which is a very beautiful Swiss uh, reel-to-reel. It was, it's a portable reel-to-reel that was originally used in the movie industry. So some of your favorite movies up until the right. 90s would have had the audio recorded on a Nagra. The English Patient, one of my favorite movies, really? would have had guys running around with the Nagra. And it's, it's, it's <laughs> super, it's got beautiful preamps and it's indestructible. You can, you can roll tape and run up a mountain in a blizzard and it'll and it'll be <laughs> perfect you know so I have been using this one for a few years now uh, it first made an appearance on an actual recording on Billy Goes to Durban mm. uh, which I took it or I drove it on the first time you were allowed out of Cape Town after the lockdowns I went up to Guy Buttery in, uh, in Durban Guy was called away in a family emergency so I was left in his studio um, with, with, with my tape deck and so I recorded three of the tracks from Billy Goes to Durban there it got the name because when guy and I, when I arrived we put a tape on um, just to show guy how it worked and mm. it said welcome to Durban <laughs> and it was a it was a recording of uh, Billy Graham the the charismatic preacher from oh, really? one of the Carolinas who had come mm. to South Africa in 1973 mm. and done a, a preached to seventy odd thousand. Uh, white South Africans in a football stadium. That's a big game. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, taped over that, and and <laughs> that was that was where it came. Yeah, Billy goes to Durban, but it was quite weird, you know, to press, press play on this thing, and it said, "Welcome to Durban." Mm. Yeah, I think, okay, thanks. Wonderful. Just drove to Durban. <laughs> so when you're pressing record, mm. do you feel when you're using tape uh, and? anything like an extra sense of pressure or does it f I mean I, I've used tape a few times and I found I've needed to be spectacularly well rehearsed and relaxed is that some is there a mindset you need to get into no I mean the great thing about the tape is if you want to stop and rewind and start again that's a mission because the tape comes off yeah, and exactly. you've got to re-put yeah, yeah. it on so so it, it 
it, it, it doesn't encourage you to do that, encourage you to keep going. I use a lot of subtractive editing. So I play with happiness and freedom and I delete what I don't like. Mm. You know, so I just, you know, I just, I don't like do something and do it again. Well, I, I just, I play the whole piece and maybe it'll be eight minutes and the final one will be five. Right. You know, so if I'm playing, like, you know, something more linear like Bach, if I'm playing and I don't like it, I'll just, I'll just keep playing. I'll mm. just do that one again. And then when I go back later, I can, del- I can delete, but I've got the mistakes in there because often the mistakes are the best part when you're not listening with the ears of the player. Mm. You know, often those are the great things. So, whereas if you have multiple takes, I hate multiple takes. I never listen back to multiple takes. I yeah. always go, that's the one. And I've, like, I've probably got a, a thousand mul- other takes out there that I've never heard and might actually be nice. <laughs> but I don't, I don't like to listen to them. It's it, horrible. It, it is difficult. I think... Um I think I'm going to try that approach because as soon as I get back with uh, with this new instrument, I'm recording my next record. Hmm. And while the thought of sitting down and making music is joyful, that whole thing, because uh, I'm self-produced uh, on this uh, project, it's going to be, you know, press record, deep breath, and then if the first note isn't perfect, then I've got to start again. No. Uh, exactly. No, just uh, make a big mess for ages and then you go and clean it up afterwards. <laughs> and preferably a few days later. Right. Oh, so you leave a gap between playing and listening? Yeah, I think that is useful. Uh, Gismonti told me that they did that for his album Solo. Mm -hmm. Uh, He recorded one day, thought it was great. It was like a three-hour session or whatever. And then Manfred Eicher said to him, look, I don't think this is... He said, I don't think this is music for the future. Let's come back tomorrow. God, imagine being told Change your flight. Come back tomorrow. I think... And and I think the very simple thing was it was a bit hyped. It was because he'd just been on tour. He was probably playing really... So mm-hmm. the next day he did a slower, da, 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 and then he said, we're going to put these tapes away for six months. I'll send them both to you after six months. You choose which one you like, and that's the one we release. Oof. So he did that, and he chose the second day. He didn't even know it was the second day, but that's the mm-hmm. one he chose. So that first day is somewhere we, no one's heard it. Amazing. And, and that's, that was a beautiful thing. I, I find I don't have to wait that long. Um, I, I, what I used to do is work with people who didn't know the guitar. So then we'd listen back, and I'd kind of look at them like this, and if they were going like, Oh, you know, then I think, but if they were just like, to something that I knew was terrible, so I would just keep a sort of straight face. Totally poker face. Yeah. And And then I'd see how they reacted. And if they weren't reacting to, oh, this is terrible, then I'd leave it for a a while. And until I was used to it. And often those are the best things, you know, it's just because your your expectation versus what happens, if that's, there's dissonance there, but you're the only one with the expectation. Everyone else is receiving it Mm. as is. And so you have to get to that point where you can receive it as what it actually sounds like, not right. compared to what you were hoping it sounded like. Mine's a little bit more like throwing paint at the wall. It's a little bit more like uh, it's it's. A, I, I, be, I, I believe a lot in 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 luck and mm-hmm. and and like things that happen. So I would be a terrible guitar maker, you know, because I would put the guitar <laughs> together and I'd kind of bang it, hope it was right, and then put the strings on and go like, let's just hope this is going to work. You just rely on serendipity to keep it together for 20 years. Yeah. Exactly. I was reading um, about the bomb disposal units in the in the Second World War and, mm. you know, they had, and, and they, the, the bombs kept changing. Right. So they'd have to, they'd have to, you know, they'd, they'd, and of course, if you make a mistake, and I was thinking like, this would be, I would be the worst person for this job because I would be like, fuck it, let's just try the red one, you know, <laughs> and see what happens, you know, but that, so that's, and then recording is, you know, it's, it's a wonderful safe space for, for that, you mm-hmm. know, it's a wonderful safe space for um, carelessness and stupidity, you know, which are useful human traits if you're not doing anything in the physical world, you know, like running country or making guitar. I was fascinated a few months ago when you made an announcement that you were going to explore a new discipline of photography, Mm. film, film. and uh, I I love looking at things that are brand new to me. I love approaching something with a uh, sort of childlike wonder kind of idea. It's brand new. What's going on there? Uh, Your work uh, in film has been very interesting to see because... There's obviously part of what you do that is highly developed as, uh, and I'm not talking in film terms, it's not overexposed, (laughs) 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 but you have a highly developed sense of aesthetics in 
one and more areas of your life. Uh, the Japanese have an expression that says, in, uh, in one thing, no 10,000 things. And it occurred to me that it may be that you are applying the same intent to photography that you do with the guitar. Yeah, I thought to myself, could I apply the logic of the guitar to a different discipline? Mm. Um, and so I taught myself, as I would teach myself guitar now, not having gone through all the long, drawn-out things. And it turns out photography was a great thing to do because it's it's got ridiculously complicated. <laughs> right. You know, the, the possibilities are endless. There's a billion geeks out there with mm -hmm. a billion ways to do things. And my mind just shuts it all out and goes like, I just I just hear noise. Like they start talking about some of the things, you know, like whatever. I just like, <laughs> so I, I started really simply. I, I, I discovered that there was an exposure triangle. Mm -hmm. You know, you had those three variables. And I started working with those three three variables and started taking pictures. Then I, I, my, my, I got my grandfather's old enlarger and I built a darkroom and I taught myself how to print again with just like, how can I get this as, you know, so even something like a contrast filter was too much information for mm -hmm. me. So I just, so basically what I did was I created a philosophy each time, which excluded everything that I couldn't, that I couldn't take on board. That you didn't necessarily yeah. need as well. Exactly. Saying. So it would be like, this is my ethos, because I needed to I needed to believe, and I suppose there's a kind of egotism there, I needed to believe that what I was doing was complete at every moment. Right. But at the same okay. time you, you, you want to be you want to be working you know, so in other words, if you're a beginner guitar player, believe that the abilities that you have is all there is and see what you can make with that. Mm. Rather than having this idea that like it's gonna be better one day and I'm just gonna keep working. You know, so it's like what have I got now? Okay. So when I did finally have the brain space to, for example, add a contrast filter, it was an amazing day. I was like running around the house like, can you see these blacks? You know? <laughs> it was amazing. So so that's been a, a process. It, it, yeah, it came out of a few things and I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm putting a lot of effort into it um it's 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 made me work with recording in, in a different way for example i recorded an album of uh, 15 minutes can't call it an album it's like an ep of the first cello suite mm. um i went up to a mountain with the nagra and i spent two days at night with the stars and the frogs recording on the tape then i thought no, I don't know if I like that. So I went to studio three, <laughs> three days later and recorded it again and much preferred that digital, you know, mm -hmm. thing. So I had this recording and I'd recorded it using a Tempura, the drone from oh, Indian interesting. Music. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, uh, Because I, I, I use that a lot in, in Bach's music and that's it's a very interesting thing to do. But it was just in my ears. But then Guy Buttery actually made me a Tempura recording oh, from his, and then I had brought it into the recording, yeah. and then I added a little bit of reverberation, mm -hmm. um, just to, you know, to open up the guitar, and that had been sitting there for a while, but I hadn't released it. And then after a month in the dark room without the contrast filter, just feeling this directness and the excitement of the directness of having this negative shining light through the negative onto the paper, watching it come out, and just having this this like black and white sketch of whatever it had been that you'd found and, 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 and the delight of that simplicity. I went back and listened to the Bach and the, 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 the reverb just irritated me. So I just turned it off. And then the drone irritated me, so I turned that off. So it, I released it as a completely, you know, acoustic recording mm -hmm. with, you know, which I've always wanted to do. I've always thought philosophically that would be a much more honest thing to do, you know, not to add some kind of acoustic resonance, sure. you know, and my early recordings were like that. I refused to allow anybody to put any thing mm -hmm. on. But then when I made uh, The Sound of Water, we, like, we, you know, Howard Butcher said to me, let's, let's do something with The Sound of Water. <laughs> and it was a great breakthrough <laughs> for me. So, yeah, so it's had, I don't know, there's, there's, there's interplay going backwards and forwards. Plus, it's a wonderful thing, you know, if you're on the road for a month mm -hmm. and you've got something to do during the day, you know, you wander around cities taking photos, it's quite fun. And then you come home and you've got some record of everything. So then there's some processing that happens. So you come back with a bunch of film and then you, mm -hmm. you know, and then so there's a little bit more conversation as opposed to this kind of dreamlike thing of moving through the world and forgetting where you were and coming back and having nothing to show, you know, just a bunch of concerts that you can't even remember, you know. Derek Ripper, you live a life on the fretboard. What does that mean to you? Hmm. 
I think what we can go back to what I said before that it's a very it's a safe space for for all sorts of um, you know human characteristics that seem that would seem to be useless in a in a society that was trying to be rational and you know build <laughs> you know roads and things you know there is there is there's a lot there's a lot about us that is that can be explored without anybody getting hurt on a guitar you know? <laughs> and and that's why i feel that you know when when people get wound up on the, on on the on their guitars and they get wound up about recordings and they apply all the worst things of of the world that we live in you know the perfectionism the the judgment that you know all that and they apply that to guitar i feel it's such a missed opportunity you know mm-hmm. because if you go up on stage and you you know hit the wrong note no one's hurt you know the, the bridge doesn't collapse you know and the bus go flying into the chasm you know nothing go nothing happens so use that freedom you know it's a wonderful thing so that's and and and, and similarly you know the idea of having an idea you know like you know the idea of constructing an idea painstakingly what about just having an idea and acting on it hmm. so for me playing a concert is 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 spending an hour and a half in the presence of a whole lot of people without arguing with myself while i play there's this wonderful ability that the mind has to pop an idea out of where i don't know where does it come from memory body memory associations and just to roll with that you know and to feel the energy of of a kind of movement and creative thing and so the life aspect what's interesting is it's been an experiment i've been making for 15 or 20 years to go don't argue let's see what happens um and and just to play this guitar not to play another guitar not to add anything to it just to say well this is all i've got what's going to happen and it's been interesting it's taken me to different places around the world um it's made me a living um it's connected me to into interesting people i keep finding myself in strange places you know as a result <laughs> of the guitar i was recently on a hot air balloon in the serengeti of i was course. not invited there because you know somebody wanted to have a conversation with me. i was invited there as a guitar player mm. and i was flying over the serengeti in a you know in a 15 air, hot air balloons all flying together with oh. these animals running thousands of of animals running underneath us and i thought this is ridiculous you know like the guitar brought me here <laughs> you know etc so so it's 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 like how does you know how can sort of un um unpremeditated messing around what can happen you know mm. what, what I, don't know, I didn't say that well but no try again <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll try again. Edit. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> how? Yeah. How can? Um, how can play? You know, where can play? Where can play take you? You know, where can this physical act of play and physical thinking and physical thought on an instrument and communication with people and just trusting that mm. that works? You know, that that's enough. Plucking a string, listening to the sound, playing a guitar amplifying it letting people hear it you know what, what can happen you know and I, and I think in the time that we live where we have so much p- possibility to expand and get more and bigger you know everything from the loop pedal to AI to mm. you know it's like there's so much you could do you know it's kind of nice to just still you know and that's I probably what's also behind my analog fascination now is the single function device of like okay well isn't it you know there was that moment when we invented something like recorded sound. Right. And then we had to improve on it and create mm. an industry out of it. So the cameras had to get better and better and better or the recordings had to get better and then we had to you know but that I'm interested in that first moment of like oh we stretched a string over a box and it made a noise. Wow, that was an exciting moment. Well, Let's go back there and just have fun. You know, it doesn't get better and that, and that's what I say to beginners like mm. you learn the first arpeggio and you're playing that arpeggio maybe the accompaniment for jarabi or something. And then I always remind them I say if you're not enjoying yourself now 
you're not going to enjoy yourself later. It's not going to get better. <laughs> so don't think that just now, you know, you're going to practice for five years. You're suddenly going to have more fun. Mm. This is as much fun as playing guitar is ever going to be. Mm. It's never going to get better than this. In fact, it's going to get worse because you're going to, you're not going to appreciate <laughs> what you can do. You're going to forget because you're so busy with all the things you know you should be doing. Mm. So this is the moment, you know, and, and if you keep connected to that, then, you know, then that's great fun and you can play an arpeggio on the guitar. That's as awesome as it gets. It is indeed. Derek Ripper, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to you for listening. Life on the Fretboard is a Michael Watts production for Fretboard Journal. Sponsors for this episode were Elixir Strings, Fretboard Journal, and you, the listener. Join me next time for a nighttime chat with the Lord of the Shell Court himself, Adam Levy. We just been to see John Mayer in concert in London, which was a first for me, and I had questions. I think I still do. Find out more next time. Until then, stay tuned.